Lovely to return to Disparate Romantics here for a, a new season. We've got some good events coming up and um, we'll mention those at the end of the webinar. A very warm welcome to regulars and of course a very warm welcome if this is your first visit. And I, I am going to do a sort of shout out to a friend of ours in Halifax called Dee. And I'm going to welcome Dee particularly because if you ever visit Dove Cottage at the moment and you see costumes, Dee is the person who created them and uh, that they add so much to the visit. Um, so tonight we're going to focus on Dorothy. Um, it's part of a, a series of events marking her 250th birthday, which of course was, was last Christmas Day. And in particular, a discussion on elements of Dorothy Wordsworth's life and writing, which have been either overlooked or misunderstood. And we'll be looking especially at her later life and through her writing, through her letters, her journals, her poems, and through the lens of the lived experience of our main guest, Dr. Polly Atkin. As we do, we will look at manuscripts as we go. Um, many of you know Polly personally and professionally. Uh, she's our neighbour in Town End. Uh, we live in the same hamlet uh, as Dove Cottage. And we met, I think, perhaps Polly, was it about 16 years ago? I think it was about then, wasn't it, when you did your PhD? Yeah, oh. July 2006, I think, would have been the first time we met. So it's, it's about right, yeah. And the, there are the PhD Romantic Legacies and Literary Geographies of the Lake District. She's a multi-award winning poet, she's an essayist, she's a nature writer, she's an academic. Um, and the book in question, um, which I'm sure uh, you all know, uh, the book in question, and also a latest book of poetry, which we both wonderful things to have. Um, Polly is also leading a number of events on Dorothy Words with 250. I wonder Polly, first of all, good evening. And secondly, would you like to say a little bit more about the things that you're organizing. Yeah, thank you, Jeff. And thank you so much for having me. And thanks everyone for um, logging on to listen to us. It's so lovely to see so many of you here. Um, yeah, so I've been really lucky this year to get some funding from Arts Council England, which has allowed me to commission five other creative practitioners in, in different fields, in music, and in literature and in uh, graphic art um, and illustration to make new work responding to Dorothy Wordsworth's life and work for Dorothy 250. And we're having a series of online events as well. Um, we had one just before Christmas to mark the birthday, but as with all of these things, when funding is involved, everything happens a little bit later in the year um, than we were originally hoping it would do. Um, so we're going to have some more events online this year. So watch out for those. Um, and we have a Twitter, which is uh, DW250, which I will put in the link for you as well. Um, so do follow us on there as well, because um, uh, there's lots of tweets of little nuggets of fun Dorothy, fun, fun Dorothy facts, what I think of as fun <laughs> Dorothy facts up there. Like Dorothy Wordsworth wrote about the cholera, <laughs> things like that. Fun facts. Well, we we always like to draw a good birthday, don't we? Why have it for just a day? Let's let's make a year of it. Um, and that that was a really good event, the one just before Christmas. Um, well, I'm equally uh, delighted uh, to welcome Dr. Joe Taylor, a uh, presidential fellow at the University of Manchester. Um, Joe's focus is on literary geographies of the long 19th century, spatial poetics, and environmental humanities. She's published many articles involved in a new book on literary digital mapping. And importantly for us, has been a, a very uh, important part of our celebrations at Grasmere uh, for Dorothy's birthday and the exhibition that we've got on at the moment um, on, well, Dorothy, uh, sister, you're going to have to help me, Joe, sister, writer, friend. Writer, sister, friend. <laughs> writer, sister, friend. Thank you. Um, in 2018, you wrote that article on Dorothy and mountaineering. And it was just after that, wasn't it, published that you, you did it yourself. You actually undertook the same walk. And uh, my memory of that it was a wet day that we did it. My main memory is us two huddled by the side of a mountain rescue thing, just getting really cold and waiting for everyone else who was in much better spirits behind us to catch up. And to put that in perspective, it was the stretcher box, wasn't it, by Stihat Town? And it was so miserable, we wondered about getting into it, I think, just, just, <laughs> just to kind of, I don't know, get shelter of some kind. But um, tell us about um, the project you're also involved in, in Women in the Hills, the AHRC network, if you would. So um, Women in the Hills has been another one of those um, things that's been um, damaged, well not damaged, but postponed by the pandemic. Um, so we got funding for this back in 
2019, I think. Um, so Women in the Hills is aiming to look at the challenges and barriers that women have faced um, participating in Outland activities from around 1800. So Dorothy Wordsworth is one of our keystone starting points through to now. Um, we are back with a series of events. We had our first one um, last week, which Carrie Andrews at Edge Hill University organised on mountains and motherhood. The recording for that will be available hopefully tomorrow um, on our Twitter feed, which is at Women in the Hills. Um, Hannah, I can't access the chat box. So if you wouldn't mind putting that in the chat, that would be really helpful. I've got a box I can't close in front of it. Um, uh, we'll have a series of events um, throughout the year. It's that uh, network that is also contributing to the Dorothy Wordsworth walking app that um, Jeff and I are continuing to work on and which um, we should be able to share in another couple of months. Um, and yeah, we're hoping with that um, with that network to ask a series of questions and provocations leading to actual change um, about um, about ongoing challenges that women at various stages of life face in in, um, in upland activities. So if anyone has any um, ideas, suggestions, questions, contributions you'd like to make to our blog, um, or you want to come to the events, then if you follow us on Twitter, you'll find out um, how to do that. That's great. Thanks, Joe. Thank you. Um, so tonight, Joe's going to be leading the conversation with Polly. And every now and again, uh, we'll show something relevant to the discussion from where I'm sitting in the Jerwood Centre at Grasmere. Uh, we plan to have a break about 8.15, we plan to close by 9. Please, as always, as Hannah was saying, please ask questions uh, in the chat, or better still, in the questions box, as she said, and we'll do our best to raise them. So before I hand over, just, I'd just like to say a brief word, if I could, Polly, about your book. Um, and this is from the heart. I'd just like to say, really, how much I enjoyed and learned from it. Um, I've read it a couple of times now, and uh, I, get, I learn more, obviously, every time I read it. And I, what I appreciate, uh, is your own perspectives being brought into the interpretation. It's like, you know, you know what Dorothy's writing about. Um, it's also, of course, academically strong. It draws on the manuscript sources right, right throughout, uh, one, does it wonderfully well. And I've worked with these manuscripts for, for 40 years, but reading your book, it's given them a whole new meaning. It's given them a whole new kind of emotional resonance. And so when, when you read about her, lying in bed, writing with a paper on a knee. The thing that we have in front of us isn't just a set of words, it's a moment in time. And, and it really does make it a 3D object rather, as it were, than just the word. So I see and I feel them in a different word, but you also make the words highlight as well. And there's some beautiful extract. The one that I, I noted down, green things burst marvelously to light. I mean, isn't that, doesn't that just sum up spring um, walking around Grasmere and the, and the, and the new life emerging, and that's from the, the later journals. I enjoyed your tracing of the reputation through the 19th century, um, and that description and interfusion that was what you call Wordsworthy in life of William Dorothy Nature. It was like, as you say, like one, one thing um, brought together. And the chapters on Dorothy's life from 1829 onwards tell a very moving story, and not just from Dorothy's point of view. So, I made a note and I said it's compelling reading because I think it is. I mean, you, you want, you know, in a way you want to know what's coming. It's a, it's a very compelling read. And it made me see the portrait of the 1833 portrait of Dorothy, which we're going to see in just a moment, in, in a completely new light. And it made me want to visit the sick room, as, as it's called, at Rydal Mount. I just felt I wanted to be there. It, it gave it a great feeling. So thank you. Um, th thank you for that. So. I wonder if, if you'd like to begin, so we get a flavour of your writing, if you'd like to begin, if you would, with a, with a passage from it. And then when you finish, Joe, uh, if I could invite you to take over. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Jeff, so much. Um, I thought I was actually going to cry uh, then, because obviously you're like, um, th there's, a, there's a couple of people, um, obviously, who I, I think of you and Pamela Woof, um, particularly, and another few academics um, who I think of as being a particularly high bar um, to, to meet, to accept this book. Um, so that's really moving. Um, I think I've been raised in, in, in flattery there, but thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Um, so it, in, in a lot of ways, though, the story of this book actually begins with Jeff in some way. So I'm, I'm going to spare you too many details of um, my life at the Words with Trust in this bit, but I'm just going to read right from the, the beginning of the book and skip a bit to explain how I got to this book. Um, and I think the first phrase, probably I've used a lot of the time, 
in academic talks about Dove Cottage too. Around tea time on December 20th, 1799, just as the light was failing, aspiring poet William Wordsworth and his sister Dorothy arrived at a small whitewashed cottage in the hamlet of Townend in the Vale of Grasmere in the English Lake District. This was to be their home for the following eight and a half years, a home recorded and eulogized in both their writings, a creative home in which the days were filled with reading, writing, walking and gardening. It will be their first real home they have had together since their mother died when William was only seven and Dorothy six and Dorothy was sent to live with relatives. Dorothy recorded their daily life in Grasmere in a journal which fed into William's poems, poems that would at first be ridiculed by critics and later make him famous around the world. 208 years and six months later, give or take a day, I moved into an attic room three doors up the road. This is where my relationship with Dorothy Wordsworth begins. By the time I finished my studies, I thought I knew Dorothy or knew my Dorothy. I thought I understood who I thought she was, but there were parts of Dorothy's life I knew nothing about, just as there were parts of the history of Dove Cottage I knew nothing about. I would move away, move back, graduate and fail to move away again before I would first hear about Dorothy's other journals written from 1824 to 1835, but never published. I think I'm gonna stop there and let Joe come in. <laughs> Thanks Polly, I think that, um that really nicely illustrates the way that, um, that the book layers, as Jeff said, your experiences in with Dorothy, but kind of more than that, implicates your, um, your thinking and your empathy um, alongside what um, the, the sort of progress that, that Dorothy makes. And I think really kind of wonderfully, you do see it as, as progress, as you sort of point out, and this is something that we'll, we'll keep coming back to, I think over the next hour or so, most, if not all previous academic biographies have kind of stopped at 1829 and said after that poor Dorothy she essentially becomes um, useless trapped in this kind of darkness um, and Polly what you do so kind of wonderfully is to demonstrate that it's it's a new stage of life not the first stage of her death. Um, I wondered if you could if you could say a little bit more along those lines about how you came to be interested in in those later years, those years that see, have seemed to so many other people to just be kind of dark and dismal and silent. Yeah, so I, I really came at it um, from a position of, as, as Jeff said, from lived experience that I am chronically ill um, myself. Um, I now know I have two um, underlying genetic conditions, which um, were both making me ill in different ways and are both systemic um, and both amongst other various really annoying things um, cause a lot of pain and fatigue. Um, but whilst I was doing my PhD, um, I didn't have a diagnosis. Um, and particularly in the years that followed, I was struggling to find a diagnosis whilst getting progressively iller um, and my cognitive function really being affected as well. So um, I was really struggling with um, short-term memory in particular. And I remember sitting in a conference paper where someone was talking about this 20 years of darkness um, at the end of Dorothy's life and just bursting into tears, um, having a kind of panic attack really, um, thinking, is, is this my life too? And is this how people are going to think about and write about me? And at that time, and even actually really when I began this book project, I was working on the hypothesis that probably it wasn't true that it was 20 years of darkness, but I didn't actually know <laughs> until I really went into it um, and, and started delving into that time. But what I did know is that some kind of terrible disservice was being done to Dorothy with the way that people talked about her and um, the way they, they wrote about um, her personhood during that time. Um, so really what underpins um, this entire project is, is my conviction um, that shouldn't be radical, but unfortunately too often is that disabled lives are worth just as much as uh, abled lives are. Did you have a moment when you were researching the book where you felt kind of vindicated, where you were like, yes, this is the evidence I needed that I was right, that my hunch was right? Oh gosh, I, I had so many, and I know I've described this before as, as 
the research was a bit like unpeeling a magical onion and it did feel like some kind of fairy tale um curse actually a lot of times where I kept thinking I, I have a handle on this and I understand what's going on um and then because so so many of the source materials have been edited and redacted at, at various times um or lost as well um so I kept finding going down one wormhole and um finding a, a detail which would make me think oh yes I, I understand this um, and then unpeeling something else. But I think I, what I did know um, even before I ever began this project is from looking at the Rydal journals when I was um, using them, both looking at them kind of academically, but also using them to make poems with. And right from that time, I did have a very strong and clear sense that she did have a physical complaint of some sort and that she wasn't making it up um, or it wasn't feminine psychology um as <laughs> has been <laughs> um thrown at her um and so many of the rest of us um at various times so I, straight away I, I knew that I was coming from that perspective even before I looked at, at greater detail um but there were these moments where I kind of see things that have been edited out of letters um or um not talked about very much in in other bits going oh right she has swollen ankles at this point okay <laughs> um and it was like a little kind of detective uh, mystery drama for me <laughs> um i promised myself i wasn't going to get really angry really on early on about the feminist psychology and um and <laughs> the kind of dismissal of dorothy's symptoms so we'll we'll hold off on that and try and keep it a, a slow burn um just to say, I'm keeping, if I keep flicking my gaze over to my uh, left, I'm keeping an eye on um, on this questions panel. So if anyone has any questions that occurs to you as we go along, then um, if you pop them in there, then I will, um, I'll try and ask them in as timely a manner as the conversation allows. Um, so kind of following on from that, I, I you have some really lovely um, passages in the book where you um gesture towards the kind of wider conversations like the the bigger reasons why you think this is important so can you can you tell us a little bit more about what kinds of conversations you're hoping to start with this book yeah so part, part of it is the fact that lived experience is important i think um in how we read uh, other people around us and something i wanted to build into the book is uh the sense that i i i'm not saying that the things that I have to say about Dorothy are the absolute outright truth um, uh, or uh, unequivocally right um, either that I am writing through my own biases as well and I think that's really important um, but in that sense I'm trying to undo a lot of biases that that have um, overwritten the way that, that she's been talked about in the past and I think one of the most important things for me is tying into the sense of um and and why this is interesting to me is that i know as um someone with complex conditions myself and everybody else i know um with chronic health conditions has had the same experience of being disbelieved about their body and about what's happening with their body um, and about their symptoms and about the severity of their symptoms um, and that was something that struck me as being part of both Dorothy's own life as she's living it, but also very much the critical reception of that life as well. And I think you only really understand how horrific that is if you've been through it, either mostly first, but, but also secondhand, if you've watched someone else go through it. Um, and I think a lot of scholarship wants to shy away from thinking about the human scholar behind the work. Um, but I couldn't have written this book if I were not chronically ill myself. I probably would have, would have written a book that repeated all of the kinds of problems that are there in other books um, for me, uh, written about that part of Dorothy's life. And I do think it's really important to, to listen to people who have a similar experience and, and to kind of learn from that. So, um, you know, if you're writing about queer history listen to queer people you know it, it's it's that simple that the um we need to stop this kind of overwriting of people's history and that is really important with disability history that so much disability history is written by non-disabled people and obviously you get a very skewed and particular context with that 
Yeah, I think that's such an important point. I think the book does a really lovely job of opening up those kinds of questions. One of the the parts that I I really appreciated was the one of the later chapters is um, a kind of symptoms list where you don't um, kind of attempt to tie the the symptoms necessarily to particular illnesses, but kind of say this is this is what she experienced and this is where the evidence is in her um, or her family's writing, and it turns her into or turn, turns her really kind of complex um, bodily, um, uh, uh, well, symptoms, it turns, uh, that, that, that experience in later life, it turns her into a kind of touchstone point for all kinds of experiences, like uh, anyone who's experienced any level of chronic fatigue will find something in, um, in that anyone who's experienced certain kinds of menstrual problems, like this, this um, as, as up to kind of things like fibromyalgia, and like there's so many, you can, uh, reading through it, you can see all the different diagnoses that you could potentially apply to Dorothy, and it makes her almost into a, into this kind of touchstone figure for um, a, a, such a wide range of um, of sort of other than able experiences in a way that I think is really lovely. Um, can I ask you to read a bit a bit further from the beginning of the book? There's a really lovely passage um, where you um, you describe in really kind of emotively why it matters to move away from the the kind of narratives of Dorothy that we're familiar with. Um, so this is from, yeah, from later on in the introduction from page 11. When I read Dorothy's journals as a new postgraduate student, I found in them records of a young woman, a little older than myself, who struggled with continual ill health. Headaches, stomach aches, toothaches, days spent in bed, unwell, days in which she gave up on, unwell. I recognised these days. I recognised the bafflement with which she sometimes met the overwhelmingly vivid world on days when she was wavering more towards ill than well. Yes, she walked at length and often. Yes, she spoke and wrote with passion. But it did not occur to me that these things would be seen as contradictory, as impossible co-tenants in the one body of Dorothy. It had not occurred to me how casually even the most well-informed readers would assume that a person cannot be both active and sick creative and sick, mobile and sick. It had also not occurred to me how much I took it for granted that a person could be all of these things until my own health deteriorated. In the summer of 2014, at the peak of a painful quest for help for my own mysterious illness, I found myself sitting through yet another conference paper that repeated the same old ideas about Dorothy's illness. Poor Dorothy, it said, as so many have said since and before. Poor Dorothy, to have been so wild and free and mobile and articulate and be reduced to this. I sat in that room and felt my face get hot and my hands go numb and my eyes fill with water. I wept for Dorothy and for myself, for everyone whose personhood has been discounted because of disability, whose experiences have been invalidated, whose life has been deemed less than worthless empty, silent. <laughs> Thank you. I, that, I, when I first read that bit, I just, I felt really kind of um, struck by it for a couple of reasons, I think. Part, partly, I mean, I, I think it, it helps us to think um, individually about ways that we've been silenced and so to emphasize, empathize with Dorothy's experience, but also it made me kind of think about the work I've done in the past and and think about ways that I've contributed to that and so I'm really grateful for that kind of um awareness not just with Dorothy but for other um writers I mean the romantics obviously have a problem that not a lot of them age um so it, so and that myth of the kind of young romantics certainly seems to contribute to this um this kind of static imagining of, of Dorothy at a certain moment in her life and a kind of resistance to accepting that that she becomes older and in a similar way to William. Sorry, but, go on. But even like, you know, e even with that, I don't know, um, I'm not totally up on Byron studies these days, but how much of thinking about Byron and the Byronic hero talks about him as disabled because yeah. he, um, he was a disabled poet. Um, and that doesn't get talked about. Um, or yeah. not with any comfort. And I mean, I guess partly because Byron himself is so uncomfortable yeah, with yeah. it. Deeply, but, deeply uncomfortable with it. 
Um, but um, yeah, it's, um, I mean, it's a part of everyday life then, then as now and not, um, not something to be, to be brushed under. Um, I wonder, Jeff, if we can see Dorothy, the Dorothy that we're talking about. Um, and more importantly, Miss Bell. And more importantly, Miss Bell. No, that's terrible. I didn't mean more importantly. Equally importantly. <laughs> we'll see what Polly means in a second. There we go. Yay. There, she, there they are. I was going to say, there she is. Miss Bell is the dog. <laughs> <laughs> So Polly, what are we looking at here? Um, what, yeah. What's Dorothy been through by this point to, to bring her here? I think that this portrait is really fascinating. So it was done in September, 1833, and it was done kind of by accident. So um, the painter who was a, a, a local um, painter had um, asked to be able to paint William and turned up to paint him. And um, hopefully Jeff might be able to tell us actually, I assume there is a portrait of William somewhere that he did also at the same time. Um, but uh, what we do have is this extraordinary portrait of Dorothy. And it's one of only two verified portraits that existed of her for a long time. Um, and I think there are actually others um, floating around. There's a, a tiny miniature um, now that is believed to be Dorothy when she was young as well. But in her 1820s journal, she talks about having a portrait done as well. So somewhere out there, there's at least one other one that we don't know about. But this, this for a long time, this was the only image we had of her face. Um, so it's 1833. She became seriously ill in 1829. She's had a couple of years by this point where she's been mostly bedbound on and off, thinking she's going to recover, um, every winter getting really ill. Um, and almost dying several times, but, but kind of coming back from the brink again. Um, and she comes at this point, she's a, she's a bit better and she's able to come downstairs, which is why she's able to have this portrait done. And so we get her here in her dark dress and her shawl and her bonnet on this amazing bright red chair. Um, and you can just kind of see here that the you can find this portrait on, online as well. So you can have a better look at the colors if you want to zoom into it. Um, but just to, um, on your screen, uh, the left of her is a window through which you can see um, the fells and the lake and what look like hollyhocks to me, these beautiful um, towers of flowers and ivy around the window. And on her lap, she's got a, a writing case. Um, Dora says it's a writing case. To me, it looks quite like a commonplace book, actually, that she was writing poems in at this time. And she's got a little inkwell um, and quill on the table next to her as well. So she's captured in the act of writing. She's holding her glasses in her hand as well. Um, so it captures her with the natural world kind of floating behind her um, and this writing going on. And most importantly as well, it captures Miss Bell, who is a little dog um, who is sitting there with her, who wasn't supposed to be in the portrait apparently, um, but uh, refused to go away. So got immortalized too. Those of us with small and quite fluffy dogs empathise with the um, difficulty of getting them to go where they um, are not glued to you at all times. Mine is currently under the desk. Um, can you say a little bit about the expression on her face? I find it really kind of intriguing that that kind of half half interrupted, but also kind of amused interruption almost. She does to me. She she does look quite amused, and I find it really interesting. So one of the reasons I wanted to write about this portrait, and I, I write about this portrait in my introduction, um, is because other people have written about this portrait and said again some quite strange and different and interesting things about it that didn't necessarily tally to me with actually looking at it. Um, which I think is really interesting as well. That when we look at a picture like this, we do read so much into it. Um, that comes from our own minds as, as much as um, from uh, the actual paint on, on the canvas. Um, but I think it's really interesting. It's quite a soft gaze, um, but it's also quite direct in a lot of ways. And um, uh, someone described her as having twinkly eyes uh, in, in this. And I think there is a bit of that. Like, I think you do see a kind of um, sense of humor going on in there in that gaze. Yeah, she definitely looks like somebody that you could chat with in this um, in this one. It's a real sense of mobility somehow about it, even though she's kind of sat sat down. The holding of the glasses and the turning um, turning her page as well. She um, she looks active, and I think I was saying to you the other day, I'd never noticed with this portrait that you could see out the window. Your gaze is kind of so drawn to her that 
um, it's it's so easy to overlook all of these details that are indicating actually how much life this how much life there still is there yeah. and how much she's still able to experience and enjoy even if her movements outside might be a bit more restricted than they once had been and and that, I think that that fact as well that she is portrayed as a writer you know she's mm. the, writing in front of her she's got her quill it's it's a very kind of um, typical way of portraying um, a writer's work in a painting as well to have that manuscript and I think that's really significant as well that it doesn't show her as um, you know a, a an old lady retired in a chair, which I think is how it's often described. It, it shows her as a as, as an active person doing. Yeah, that. she's not an invalid with no agency here, is she? Um, at all. What um, what symptoms is she experiencing at, at this point? She's sort of in the in a sort of slight hiatus, isn't she? At this point, between two quite serious episodes of illness. So between 1829 and 1835, she has a series of. Um, acute episodes that seem to me, um, I will say uh, that this is this is my theory that they they seem to be um, based around some kind of bowel complaint. Um, my theory is that she probably had um, inflammatory bowel disease of, of some kind, and that it became suddenly worse in 1829, and then she has five years of, of really very serious episodes, which then start to um, because it's essentially untreated, start to affect other parts of her body as well, which is where this leg swelling comes in um, and um, this kind of non-traumatic brain injury, which, which she sustains in 1835 as well. Um, but at this point, she's, she's had um, at least two episodes where they've been going up, right, she's not going to last till morning now, including the first one in 1829. Um, but she's a bit better um, she's had uh, these terrible episodes of leg swelling um, when she then uh, became very weak as well and, and couldn't really walk afterwards. Um, but it's managed um, through a kind of physiotherapy um, to get some mobility back and is now able to come downstairs again for short periods of time and sit up in a chair rather than just sitting in bed. Um, so it's a it's a kind of um, uh, happy re reprise in, um, in these years of illness get a sense of that I think in a letter that Dora wrote which I think you have have to hand yes yeah, so, by magic um, so I think Je Jeff might might have um or were we, were we going to just look at the portrait for this um but uh yeah this is Dora describing it so amazingly um Dora writes a letter to Rotha Quillenen um to um uh Rotha who who would become her um stepdaughter eventually um, where, and it's a really long letter, she's talking about lots of things in it, but, but she's also talking about Dorothy and how Dorothy's looking a little bit better. Um, so she says, Dorothy's never looked so well or been so well since her first attack 20 months ago as a present. She can read and write and work and talk and walk about her room without a stick and dress herself entirely, drives out every day when the weather permits, sometimes even comes downstairs to see her friends and takes frequent walks along the upstairs passage and even surprises Mr. Carter with the morning call in his office, going down those two or three steps unassisted except by her stick. So you can see there um, how unusual a turnaround this is. She has been sitting for her picture to a Mr. Crosswaite, a self-taught artist, a native of Cockermouth, and a weaver by trade until he was 20 years of age. From his history and his price five guineas, much was not to be expected. But for him, he has done wonders and has delighted us all by making an admirable likeness of my aunt and such a pretty picture. At least so it was when he took it away on Saturday. But there is much to be done to it before it is finished in background, etc. And I hope he may not spoil it in the finishing. She is taken just as she is now, sitting in her large chair with paper case on her knee and pen and ink on the table on one side and little Miss Bell on the other, looking so pert and funny. The artist came to Rydal to claim the fulfillment of a promise which my father good-naturedly made some years ago to sit to him, and he really has succeeded in making a very respectable likeness of your godfather. Um, so he he painted both of them, um, but it is the, the portrait of Dorothy, um, which is the same size, begun for charity, he says. Um, uh, so it's, it's a gift. Um, but as the work proceeded, our charity turned into gratitude to the little man for putting us into possession of a thing so valuable. Um, so they really 
value this this one good likeness that they have of Dorothy. I just noticed Polly um, on this picture that there's actually more than one pen. Yes. And given that, that Dorothy often mentions, doesn't she, the, the wretched pens that she's yes. in the plural, um, there they are, there's more than one pen. And yeah, she's, she's, she's already wrecked one during the sitting of this portrait and how to have another one. <laughs> Does she have a really heavy hand? Is that why she gets through so many quills? Or is she just a bit coderage about it? I don't. It, well, it's it's not really clear, is it? She just um she just says she always ruins them, and and I, I suppose we can't really know um quite how. I don't know if you have any theories, Jeff. I don't, but it's something she's often saying, isn't it? Even in the Dove Cottage years, you know, please, please, you know, excuse this wretched pen and this wretched paper. It's like a lifetime of problems with her writing instruments. But... At some point, you've got to wonder whether or not it's the tools or the venture. <laughs> <laughs> um. Poor Mr. Crossway as well. They didn't really have a lot of faith that he was going to be able to do a good job, did they? Well, you never know with Dora. Dora is a bit snarky in her letters as well. So um, I, I wouldn't always take what Dora says as a general consensus, I would I say. I do like that about Dora, though, the fact that she's like William often thinks that she's just so like sweet and innocent and fairy like, and then she's actually pretty catty. <laughs> um, what so uh, that letter really really neatly encapsulates some of the qualities of Dorothy that we're really familiar with from say the Grassmere journals so um her walking of course with or without a stick um but also her relationships with um other members of the family but also other members of the community the village how um how are those relationships in in these years how how do they change between her illness in 1829 and say 10 years later when she's kind of quite seriously ill? Well, it's difficult, isn't it? Because a lot of the time then during those years, she's um, uh, essentially bed bound. Um, so she's not able to go out and see people anymore. And often when they do come to see her, she's she's too ill to see them as well. So. Um, she does um, refer to that quite a lot in the journals that she'll say so and so came, but um, too ill to see them. Um, so she becomes quite isolated, um, really. And um, as you could see in that letter, Dora was saying, you know, she's able to read and, and write at, at this time, but that was quite unusual um, during her illness. And there were lots of periods where she couldn't really concentrate enough to read or write. So um, she's always conducted a lot of friendship by correspondence as well. And um, some of her closest friendships were, were conducted by correspondence, really, um, most of the time because of um, geography. Um, and at, at this point, then she's kind of shut off from them because she she can't concentrate on a long letter, either to read it or to write it. Um, I think hopefully in um, in our next bit, we'll get some time to talk about Henry Crabbe Robinson, um, a yeah. beautiful relationship that develops. Oh, my goodness. In Dorothy's yeah. later years he's so devoted um and just writes about her in fact let's talk about it now let's talk yeah. about Henry Crabbe Robinson Polly before we um, yeah. before we have a break Henry Crabbe Robinson is, is one of these people like I, I didn't know much about him at all before um I began on this and then I realized that um so many of the most evocative letters during those years are, are written to and, and from him um so uh, he is um, the relation of, of Catherine Cookson, who was one of her um, very best friends as well. Um, and I, I think that they they meet through her, but they become really close friends. Like I would describe them as besties. I have to, like jokingly describe them as besties. Um, and I think a really interesting relationship as well, because um, Henry Crabbe Robinson never marries um, either. Um, and I think they just become really important to each other that, that they are almost like family. Um, and Dora refers to them as the lovers uh, a lot, which I don't see at all that there's anything romantic. No, but they are very cute. Like um, their relationship is just lovely, just so yeah. generous to each other. Yeah, completely. And like, he spends a lot of Christmases at Rydal Mount over the years. So um, he'll come and spend time with them. And um, yeah, their, their letters at uh, really extraordinary it's it's an it's an amazing friendship it's a really true deep friendship I, I think um he also uh, seems to be one of the few people who doesn't write Dorothy off um, yeah even when her abilities change well yeah I mean there's a couple of slightly odd like there's a couple of questionable things he says actually unless mm. 
other people, which I'd, I'd pull him up on uh, <laughs> myself. Um, but he does he does keep coming to see her. And um, there's one amazing episode where um, she says that he offered to. So one of the things that they do when her legs are, are swollen um, to relieve both the swelling and she gets these terrible muscle spasms as well. Um, is that they massage her legs. And most of the time, this is William's job. Um, and when he's off visiting, um, Henry offers to do it. And she's like, that I will not allow, <laughs> which I think is really wonderful. Um, I wanted us to turn in this, um, in this second half to having a closer look at Dorothy's writing. Um, one of the, the points that you make so well in the book and one of the things that the book um tries really hard and really successfully I think to do is to give Dorothy's voice back um after a, a long period of of silencing can you say a little bit more about the the many and varied ways that um that Dorothy I think may, I think it's maybe fair to say both in some ways silenced herself, but more seriously was silenced by other or has been silenced by other people since sort of in her lifetime and since. Yeah, so um, I think Dorothy's own relationship with authorship is really complicated and something I try and touch on this in this book, but I think I don't um, fully get to even, but she, she's obviously very conflicted about it. And I've, I had a problem for many years um, with, the way that it's often said that you know Dorothy's very oppressed by William, and that's why she's she's not a writer. Um, and uh, all the men are see you know there's a very kind of basic um, uh, feminist argument which completely fails at feminism by saying that that all the men just kind of write her down and um, stop her from being a writer when they were completely surrounded by all these amazing creative women in their lives. Um, so a lot of the people she's corresponding with, who she goes to visit, um, uh, who they stay with, are um, women writers and artists. She, it's not like she doesn't have the, the models um, for those in her life. Um, but she has, the way she describes it herself is that she has incredibly exacting standards. So what I started to think actually was that she will accept William being a poet and she'll try and help him be a better poet than he would be without her. <laughs> um, but that she just never thinks she's good enough. Um, so she's never satisfied with what she manages to create, um, which I think is a lot of um, a very familiar feeling that a lot of us have about writing anyway. Um, but it just completely stops her um, from being able to, to kind of fulfill that. And um, she also has lots of really complicated feelings about kind of public and private as well and, and putting her name to stuff and, and losing her privacy um, as, a, as a private person. Um, but all of that is completely aside, I think, to what happens with her writing after she dies. And one of the strangest things um, that I, I still remember my shock when I first found out that this was real and not a joke, um, that Gordon Graham Wordsworth, um, who um, was her great, great nephew, I can never remember how many greats there is unless I'm looking at it, um, who, who was, um, who came in, into possession of, of all of the papers in the um, early 20th century. Um, he edited them so he actually chopped bits out that he didn't think other people should be able to see. Um, and that's particularly pertinent with the Rydal journals, which I think Jeff is gonna show us, um, that he chopped out a whole chunk that deals with, yeah, 1831 to 1833, where um, he thought it was too terrible for anyone to read about her illness. Um, so this is the journal, um, and in the middle. Interesting, uh, isn't it? Oh, there's, there's his writing. Right yeah. On top of all of Dorothy's, it is distinctive red. It's, and and it, it, it is this, this weird... Red pen, Gordon, what are you doing? <laughs> of the red pen, well, so you can see it. Uh, you know, different ideas about uh, conservation at, at that point. So this is 1907 um, that he's, he's doing this, isn't it? Mm. And, and look, look there, there's pens. I don't know if you can read that. Pens. Yeah. Anyway, that's, that's the point you were making, isn't it? Is that, is that I think, yeah. 
There you go. I think that can be seen on these pages. Yeah, it's so, so, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, these are literally pages that have been sliced out. He's just sliced them out. And um, one of the weirdest things is that he keeps notes of bits of those days that he thinks are, are less awful. And he thinks he's doing something, like this is the awful thing, is that he thinks he's doing something positive. He thinks he's protecting her legacy, protecting the rest of us. So he makes this notebook that Jeff has here, um, which is the most fascinating thing. I came to see this and I'm absolutely enthralled by it. Um, where he makes notes of the things that he thinks are acceptable um, from these days. Um, but he cuts out all the stuff that refers to her illness, um, which do, do you have the description there, Jeff, at the beginning where he says it's too horrible? Um, there we are. Yeah. In so, this volume, I've made extract from the journal kept by Dorothy Words of um, February the 12th, 1831, September 8th, 1833. Within that period, there were considerable intervals of illness in which no record was made. And then he, he goes on, in the week before Christmas 1831, she was seized by a violent attack of internal disorder and inflammation, accompanied by acute pain and nausea. The prostration appears to have lasted till the following October, when the journals were renewed. But the entries for the next months are so full of um, a, a my, my new and distressing, my new and distressing details um, of her malady that I have no hesitation on excising and destroying them. And I just think that's so extraordinary. No hesitation. They're, they're so awful that he has no hesitation in excising and destroying them. And the problem is that leaves us with just this massive gap in knowledge, doesn't it? We 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 don't know and. Actually, Joe, earlier, you mentioned menstruation, and I keep thinking about this, that that's the one thing we, we really know nothing about with Doris. This is one of my pet theories about the journal, um, that she complains about headaches, like, really regularly and has to take herself to bed really regularly. And, like, I, I want to know if anybody's done, like, um, a cycle calendar for yeah. those symptoms, because that seems to, I mean, this is, again, that kind of risk of, self, of sort of yeah. a diagnosing based on, um, more sort of personal experiences but that at least to me seems to be like a really obvious starting point for but we don't we don't talk about menstruation and the romantics that they didn't I, I think people have tried that actually it doesn't fit um I I think that has been attempted um but also that doesn't necessarily mean that there wasn't a hormonal element yeah. because um you know if, if you have problems um, with your hormonal cycle it might That's, not yeah kind of part of it <laughs> exactly exactly it doesn't necessarily work like that does it um but we know absolutely nothing about that and there's there's one point later on where um when she's recovered a bit and mary says she she no longer complains of pain in in that particular area that she used to talk about a lot mm. and this could just mean her bowels because obviously she has a lot of pain in her bowels all the time um but then you also wonder if it yeah it, we yeah, don't... where because I mean it's so difficult to tell as well, isn't it? If you're getting kind of generic cramping, exactly. But then, then on the other hand, we do know in very acute detail. Someone's asked a question about uh, Harriet Martineau, and yeah. you know, with Harriet Martineau, we know a lot about her uh, fibroid. Um, yeah. So uh, it, it's also not true to say that we we didn't know about. Um, I don't women's medicine issues. <laughs> I can't like find a, a way to encompass that without sounding euphemistic. Um, but the the there was knowledge of that in the Romantic era. So um, it would be odd, I think, if it were that and nothing were mentioned anywhere. But and mm. I couldn't find anything. Um, I think that's a, a it's one sort of really important strand that your book is highlighting. Really, that we need to not be embarrassed about talking about this uh, this kind of stuff otherwise we'd risk replicating exactly this kind of historical excision mary does it a bit as well doesn't she there's um, a couple of letters where she um she alludes to dorothy's embarrassing symptoms but yes. but can't bring herself to say what those are um, and and i think a lot of the time i i think that is to do with um bowel things and i think one mm. of the reasons why i i didn't realize when i was um, starting to write this book that um, I started eventually to joke about as a book about romantic bowels. Um, <laughs> but, um, I, it, it is um, because I, I didn't know because a lot of the cleaner versions of 
Um, these histories don't don't show it, but but it is a lot of her problem is is to do with bowels, and she's not bothered by it at all. She will tell you all about it. So I'm wondering if those missing years, um, if what she's doing is is telling you all about it. Yeah, and she writes loads of letters to Coleridge, who also famously was not shy about talking about his bowels in exactly. excruciating detail. Exactly. Um, um, I think they're bonded um, by both their problems with their bowels and um, wanting to talk about it with each other as well. It's like their own little mini support group, isn't it? Yeah. It is, which is really important as well. Yeah, definitely. It's it's. I found that bit really kind of moving in a way that she knew that she had somebody that she could, even if she couldn't necessarily talk to her family about um, as openly um, or with as much sympathy as she might have liked or needed. She had somebody else for a while that she could... Um, she could sort of compare experiences with. You can see this bit um, Jeff is, is showing here. There's a, um, a little bit of poetry, a bit of... Um, oh, that's from Thoughts on My Sick Bed, yeah, is it? Thoughts on My Sick Bed, um, written along the side there as well, a prisoner in this quiet room, nature's best gifts are mine. Um, and this idea she came back to again and again in her poetry at, at this time about, is she a prisoner in the room? Is she not a prisoner mm. in the room? how does she make herself not a prisoner in the room what I find fascinating about the manuscripts of particularly this poem and its various sort of variants is the way that it it seems to play around with that kind of imprisonment on the page as well um kind of both as in that example both being kind of constricted to the margins but also um overflowing those margins so it, it acts that kind of no prisoner prisoner um and, and you can see sense. as well in the in the material object of those journals how much there is um, like the Grassmere journals that they're notebooks that are used for all sorts of things you know all of that account keeping in there um, little notes um, you know they're really messy objects but really mm. fancy objects because of that that they're um, they're really complicated life objects. Oh, well, I think this is a, a good moment maybe to turn to the sort of physical act of of writing. Jeff, I think, has um, has a couple of examples of her writing before she gets ill um, and then when she um, when she's writing during her um, her ill years. I think we've got an example from around 1834. So how how does she write? So sort of physically, how does the act of writing change in in these later years? So increasingly, she's writing in bed um, and um, writing propped up with a head propped up on pillows and writing on her knees, um, which is still the state for a lot of people um, who find sitting up difficult. Mm. Um, and I have a lot of friends who write like that and have done myself at various points. Um, it's not easy with a laptop. Um, it was definitely not easy with paper and ink and quill pens so you can imagine how physically difficult that was when as we've discussed throughout her life she found the act of writing quite difficult she and William both of them found um, the physical act of of scribing uh, mm. hard um, I wonder she, if that is somebody asked earlier about whether or not they were left-handed I'm assuming they didn't write left-handed because it's not smudgy enough but whether or not they were actually left-handed and encouraged to write right-handed from the slant that suggests mm. And it doesn't it um but i also wonder um uh you know william talks about having pain in his hands a lot when he's writing as well mm. and whether there's something physical going on with that and, and why that's difficult for them uh, as well so what we have on the screen here i think is when i can't quite see the date jeff um, it's um it's uh, 1834 um and it's uh, it's that very point you're making Wally, because something for the last uh men something that's turning an ill pen letter for the last mentioned failure my excuse is that i lie on my back in bed and with uplifted knees form a desk for my paper yeah and you say that's quite common don't you particularly from a certain date onwards it become sort of more the norm and, and you can see actually this letter, she's trying, you can see how hard she is trying to make this really neat actually mm. is, um, and, and how much effort she must have put into that. Because the other side of that is that because she's, she's finding herself increasingly fatigued after every activity, that writing a letter also exhausts her as well. So it's not just that she finds it physically difficult to do the letter writing, um, it's that then it has a toll 
for ages afterwards too. So those two things combined just makes it really difficult. Letters like this do really highlight the way that writing is a physical act as much as it is an intellectual one as as well. So it's um it's not some it's not something passive, it's something that she has to has to really kind of focus on the movements of. There's a, there is the earlier one. I'm just um just struggling to turn the pages with a camera in my hand. Um, but but there's, um, there's one, isn't there, where she says, it, this letter's taken several days to write. There's one, mm, of there's one to Jane Pollard, isn't there, that Polly, I think you mentioned, that takes about a week. There's, there's quite a few, actually. It, it, I mean, it, in some ways, this has been a feature of her, and this is one of the things I find fascinating, is that all the things that actually were a feature of her life the whole way through are just exaggerated in her mm. illness. Um, so the same thing will happen with with her journals as well, that she'll often drop out um, for days or weeks um, when other things are going on and then come back in again um, with them. Um, and that happens when she's young and supposedly healthy um, as much as it does later on. And the same things happen with letters that she'll say, oh, I started this letter, wrote, finished it a week later. Um, but it, as she becomes iller and as everything becomes much more difficult, obviously that becomes um, even harder that, you know, she'll start a letter, get interrupted by a visitor coming, and then she literally won't have the strength or energy to, to continue it um, for another week. Although she's not doing anything else either, she's just trying to exist. Mm. So okay. her letter, sorry. sorry Jeff. Jeff, just, just to pick up on Holly's point there, Thursday, strange to say it, mm. this first scroll has been the work of four days. Mm. Yeah. Is, um, it is five. Is it five since I began with it? The yeah. Truth is that a small matter stops me. Yeah. A visitor. And then, as you say, she becomes exhausted and strolls to return. So we can see, I think, the effect of her illness both on the, the length of the letters increasingly later on as they get sort of shorter and shorter, but also even in, in sort of longer examples like this where they become really fragmented and even in her sentences you can you can sort of hear how how difficult it is in moments for her to get from one end of a, a sentence to um to another are there other ways that we see the effect of her illness impact the forms of her her writing or her modes of expression do, do some kind of forms start to take precedence yeah, so I, I, I think this ties into why she starts writing more poetry, um, which is partly, I think, also because she has um, more time on her hands when she's not bothering with other people's poetry. Um, but also, I think there is something about poetry which, um, in its very nature, is a bit more accessible um, when you feel a bit more fragmented yourself um, in, in a strange kind of way, where it feels more approachable to write. Um, but also I think that um, conversely, it kind of captures the, the strangeness of those sensations um, that she's trying to write about. It's a, it's a form of self-examination as much of a, a form of recording. So like her journals get more and more fragmented, but alongside that she's, she's writing more and more poetry where she's trying to explore these experiences that she's having and, and try and make sense of them. So what we're looking at here, I think, is her commonplace book. Yeah, so this is her commonplace book, which she keeps for years, and it's a book where she um, keeps all sorts of things in there. So she'll write out bits of other people's writing. Um, it's a kind of almost like a scrapbook. She'll um, paste other things in occasionally too. But in the middle of this, she makes a book within the book, which, as you can see here on the page, it says sickbed consolations composed during the spring of the year 1832. What actually follows are poems composed for much longer than that, because I think at that point she still thinks she's going to recover um, as we all do in the early stages of a long illness. Um, and she doesn't realise it's going to be sickbed constellations composed in the years 1832 onwards. Um, and then you can see, see them here that she then starts increasingly to use this book um, as her poetry drafting book, which is amazing. It's so powerful to see the way that she's working out her, her verse. Dora says, doesn't she, that um, I think this is about thoughts on my sick bed, that she um, she can't really write in metre. And I always find like that's always something that I'm another one of those Dora moments where I'm a bit like, hey, are you, like, are you reading her 
appropriately though like she can't write in regular meter but her body isn't functioning at this point in kind of regular yeah. meter Can I say to, to be honest like I don't think there's a, a lot wrong with her meter most of the time I don't well, know that too but like it seems perfect yeah. like it functions the feet are yeah. all in the right place but even even those places where it, it limps a bit that always seems to me to be deliberate like there's a couple of moments and thoughts on my sick bed where it where the, the lines kind of fall off but it falls off in moments where she's talking about her sense of languor of weakness yeah. Yes, and it, it feels entirely appropriate mm. uh, and um, kind of Hardian um, almost where, where she shifts meter. Um, but that, yeah, I think she really kind of took those feelings to heart. Yeah, uh, it does seem quite radical to me in a way that I think Dora doesn't appreciate. And Dorothy's kind of, as you're, you've kind of indicated, she starts to seem a little bit freer or a bit more forgiving with her verse. And at this point, and that kind of allows her to to experiment in a way that she maybe doesn't feel comfortable with um, earlier on. Ironically, given the experiments that she's editing into William's work. And you can see there that this little penciled silent uh, mm. there on the page where she's like uh, doing exactly what we all do with poems where you're going through and going, no, that's not the right word. No, that's the one um, I want instead there. And as she copies out copy after copy after copy um, of the poems and they just shift a little bit um, every time. I just uh, noticed the, the, the last line on the stanza. It, it is very similar to our type of our expression to Dorothy, bard, brother, friend. There's a oh, yeah. certain resonance. <laughs> I wish that was for deliberate. <laughs> yeah, I wish it was. Oh, well, of course it was, Jeff. Of course uh, it was, yeah. <laughs> but there's that return to the prisoner uh, idea, isn't there? No prisoner. In yeah. This room, I saw the green banks of the Y in reference to women. She changes that, doesn't she, Polly? I think you, you read this poem. Yeah, it shifts through different drafts um, and she really struggles with and, and also because this this phrase about being a prisoner in my room appears in different poems as well. So it also appears in the um, uh, and I think the bit we saw in the journal actually was not from this poem. Um, I think it was from the um, uh, composed on an April morning, mm. blah, 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 that one with the incredibly long title. Um, where she again repeats this this image of the the prisoner in the in the lonely room, um, but yeah, she she kind of goes back and forth um, about I was a prisoner, I wasn't a prisoner. No, I'm not a prisoner. Why am I not a prisoner? Kind of exploring all these these different things. It is lonely. It isn't lonely. Yeah. I mean, a lot of the time she's not lonely because she gets a pet robin. This is one of my favorite factoids. <laughs> This is this is my absolutely favorite thing as well that she has a robin who comes and lives with her in her room, and I think this is one of the things that I found most extraordinary and most most useful actually, um, particularly because I was writing this book, um, and certainly those passages um, about um, her being mostly um, housebound and garden bound mm -hmm. in the eighteen thirties um, last winter and spring during lockdown. Um, and um, I was feeling similarly confined. Um, and she brings the outside into her. So she has all these, these pot plants that she puts in her room um, and she has the trees outside her window and she keeps her window open so that, yeah, a robin comes in and, uh, and ends up building a nest above her bed. Um, and She plants those pot plants seasonally as well, doesn't she? She yeah. takes whatever's growing in the garden. So she can have a like a miniature version, like like her room is a terrarium, really. Mm. Um, uh, really extraordinary. Um, and yeah, I, I found a useful thing to think about. I want to come back to that in a minute um, with um, Connor's question. But I wondered if before we sort of slide over to audience questions, um, those of you who haven't read Polly's poetry collection much with Buddy, firstly, you're of course missing a treat, but you're also missing some um, really creative responses to um, Dorothy's uh, journals and particularly these later journals. And I just wanted to invite Polly to read, uh, well, to explain a little bit firstly about the writing process of, um, of this poem um, and to read a little bit from, um, from one of those poems. Yeah, so um, the poems, so the central sequence of um, this is my second collection, Much With Body, um, which came out last October um, with Seren. Um, and the central sequence um, is a series of poems that were all found and kind of collaged 
from transcripts of the Rydal journals. Um, there's one one which is, is a very long um, poem, which is every reference to writing, um, in the Rydal journals, which um, I'll spare you from. Um, but what I was really interested in when I, I kind of was looking at those journals is how much of her experience I find echoed in my own um, and how the weather seems to take on this um, really antagonistic state um, where it's kind of coming to, to get you and, and, and make everything so much more difficult. Um, and rain starts to kind of stand in for pain um, as she goes along. Um, so in the sequence, which gives the title to the collection, Much With Body, um, I, I kind of piece that together um, in slightly different ways. So I'll just read a couple of, and it's all little, um, you can see here, little kind of short segments, um, which are not meant to be Dorothy's voice um, so much as kind of finding something else in there. Um, so I'll just read a, a couple of uh, little bits of that, including some bits of the garden. Um, so this is her finding, um, this finding things there. The rain will not depart from its accustomed strongholds. A glittering shower travels over us. I have been sticking leafy green twigs of elder among my spring and winter flowers. My garden, all of the seasons visited by bees taking no rest. Misty, muzzly, bird chaunting morning, gone off in this misty rain. I was very poorly last night from pain and better, still in pain. I am weakly, therefore afraid to go down, afraid of the fatigue of downstairs, better though in pain. Butterflies and bees amid my gardens. I am free from pain and I could not join in prayers. My flowers everlasting, I long to be out. How I long to be free in the open air, birds or singing the earth and air preparation for worship and rest from slaughter. Something in the air oppresses. I am not well. Still they tell me the air is too cold for me. To go out and feel it, the blighting wind bars me up, helpless household, my little cell, glorious red of anemones, my treasure all winter. Thank you, Polly. I really, I really love that poem. Part, and I think it, it sums up the conversation that we've been, um, we've been having. I think that it, it expresses so nicely that um, almost symbiosis that you seem to find with Dorothy um, in this period, but also I think turns what we saw Gordon Wordsworth call that internal disorder earlier into a really powerful creative force, um, uh, something that's that's really courageous, but almost more importantly, really active and um, I can't think of a better word than loud, but um, really vocal and and that demands listening to, I think really is what I mean. Um, I want to turn to a couple of questions from um, from everybody else. So um, we've mentioned Harriet Martineau very briefly. Maddie Goodall is asking what crossover or correspondence there, there was between Dorothy and Harriet Martineau and their experiences of sickness. And I fear this is a disappointing answer. Uh, well, yeah, yes and no, not really. Um, so obviously they're, they're neighbours and Harriet Martineau came over um, a lot, but she only really knew Dorothy when she was sick. And I think mm. this is really interesting. Um, but also I think there's a lot of lateral labelism going on there um, too. Um, so Harriet, by this point, when she moved to the Lake District, thought that she'd been cured by mesmerism, um, which we'll just leave aside <laughs> for a minute there. Um, uh, so I don't know, maybe her attitude towards sickness was not as um, generous as it could have been. Um, but she wrote an obituary of Mary Wordsworth where she talks quite upsettingly um, about Dorothy um, in a way that um, upset a, a lot of the, the rest of the family. Um, uh, and, and it's hard to tell. I don't think there was much correspondence between them. And then it's a really, again, really frustrating moment where um, all of the family gets um, thoughts on my sick bed. Um, oh, sorry, um, uh, notes, notes from a sick room. Is that Harriet Martineau's book? Mm -hmm. Titles are too similar, um, and which is her her book all about 
her illness, which I think is a really fascinating book and really it's full of amazing, really interesting stuff about crip time um, and the experience of illness, um, which Harris is writing while she's thinking uh, unforgiving thoughts about Dorothy's illness, bizarrely. Um, and the family in Rydal Mound read it out to each other, but Dorothy is too ill to be able to concentrate for long enough to listen to such a complicated thing at that point, um, which is really sad. Yeah, there's a sort of un a, an unforgivingness about Martineau's attitude to Dorothy in, in these years and so on. And especially because like Martineau attributes walking like to her or her recovery largely to her walking, like she moves to yeah. the lakes and it's like, oh, now I can walk everywhere and it's a miracle. But then it's still willing to sort of perpetuate that myth that Dorothy's sick because she walks too much. Yeah. Um, it, it's all very, it's, it's very strange and interesting. Um, and I'd love to sit Harriet down and have a really serious conversation about it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, she's very, she's very empathetic and very, um, very good at kind of critically thinking about other people's experiences in other contexts. But maybe this is a little bit too personal for her or... Um, or something that she's less able to take her. Yeah, and I, also the, back. there was this strange relationship between them as well. That the words was are a little bit um, salty as well about mm. the whole mesmerism thing as well. So yeah, know, there's not really the kind of thing that's going to be <laughs> their bag, is it? Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, so maybe there was a little bit of awkwardness between them with their different illness accounts and different relationships with the local community and um, and things as well. They, they approach living living there really quite differently, don't they? Although they are kind of, they do hang out together too. So it, mm -hmm. it, it's complicated. It's, it's a complicated relationship. Hartley Coleridge likes Harriet Martineau a lot, but then he obviously didn't always like the Wordsworths very much. So, uh, so maybe there's something in there. Um, so one more question as well from, um, from our favourite Connor. Um, he asks um, for our thoughts on how this recently recovered Dorothy ties in with eco-feminist criticism. Um, and we've maybe not talked as much as we um, we perhaps wanted to about the ways that Dorothy's relationship with nature changes um, and adapts in these in these years. What do you think? Yeah, I, I think that's really interesting. Um, and I think uh, the relationship that that she has with the natural world, I think, is is particularly interesting because it isn't severed by not being able to walk out into it. Mm. Um, so I think it really gives a really important. Um, disability perspective, um, but also all of those things that we already know Dorothy for um, of uh, that um, permeability between the body um, and the outside world, and particularly the natural world, keep going on um, through those years. You know that doesn't go away, and this is one of the things which I think is really important about the Rydal Journal, and why I'm so glad that um, a, an edition is being worked on that, that will come to public in the next few years, because when people can see it, they'll be able to see that, that yeah, she's exactly the, the same person with all these amazing visions of, of this world around her. Um, and it doesn't matter that she's living mostly in one room. And to think that it does, I think, is a um, uh, shows a great lack of vision on the part of other people. Um, so yeah, I, I think definitely there's an eco-feminist perspective um, in there. and um, I think should be a really interesting case study for someone to look at in that way as well. Yeah, I think, as he, uh, thank you. That's <laughs> is, is he disagreeing? <laughs> Whenever a, a pet interrupts like that, I think they have a really important point to make um, a, about what's just been said. Yeah, she feels very strongly about ecofeminism. Um, that's my dog Rotha, who was named after Rotha oh, Quinnell. <laughs> Um, so she just wanted her voice to be heard, like she has a part in this conversation too. Um, I think like you were saying the um, about the way that Dorothy's illness highlights a lot of issues that come to play much earlier in her life. This is also one of them, like there's that, there's a, that kind of branch of reading, which really irritates me, um, that talks about how um, dull Dorothy's uh, journals are because they're so everyday. Um, uh Anyone who's listened to Law My Praxis will be, the podcast will be familiar with this argument. It comes up quite frequently there. And I find it really frustrating because I think that in itself, even like throughout her writing career, becomes a really feminist issue. Um, Kathleen Jamie picks up on this in some of her 
more, more kind of recent essays that we think of nature and nature writing as belonging to a certain kind of I wandered lonely as a cloud, um, largely male stance. And that precludes the domestic and the confined and people for who, for whatever reason, um, become um, com become constricted in their in their movements, and that really limits the versions of nature that we're coming across and who's allowed to access it. So, um, so yeah, I think Connie, you raise a really um, a really important point here that like, it's it's an eco feminist issue for sure, but it's also in an issue that has much wider um, implications about who gets to write nature and how. And, and also who's included in, it in ecological thought, as mm. well, I think is another reason why I think Dorothy Wordsworth is, is often touted as a um, early environmental thinker in, in some ways, but then only because we don't look at that other parts of her life as well. And I think it's really important to think of her as a disabled writer um, in that aspect. And that changes then what you're trying to say the whole thing means. I'm going to be talking about some of that aspect more um, with a talk um, in Baspa University's research seminar series on, I believe, the 23rd of February. It is not advertised yet, um, but watch out for ba Baspa events um, and you will see that coming up where I'm going to be talking about these kind of um, uh, um, environmental studies and disability studies and, and where they might intersect. That leads us, I think, really nicely into passing back to Hannah to hear um, about the Wordsworth Trust's upcoming events. But thank you so much for that, Polly. It was such a treat to get to talk about um, about Dorothy with one of the most knowledgeable people about Dorothy, and particularly this point in her life. <laughs> just, just before we do, um, can I just uh, maybe just round off by, by mentioning one or two events coming up? Because uh, we've heard from two great scholars this evening. We've got uh, more in our series that some of these dates are yet to be finalized, but we've got Lucy Newlin coming up, uh, author of All in Each Other, to talk about Dorothy's relationships with, with Coleridge, with William, but also with her friends, Catherine Clarks and Lady Beaumont, Jim Pollard. We've got Michelle Levy from Simon Fraser University, who's going to, I think, spend the whole time talking about that commonplace book that we looked, the book with the poems in. Uh, Jessica Fay from Birmingham uh, is going to come and talk about Dorothy Words and her relationship with artists, which is something I have to confess to know little to nothing about. So I think that'll be uh, wonderful too. And let's hope too, Polly, as you say, with the new edition of the later journals, that we have an evening on those as well with, with Nick Mason and Susan Sutton, uh, who are the editor, editors of that. Um, the dates aren't finalised. Um, what you can do is subscribe to us on social media to, to find when they do become finalised, or you can subscribe to our Eventbrite page, um, and they will that will notify you notify notify you um, of when the events are coming up. So hope you'll join us. Um, without people being part of this, uh, it, it's just not worth doing. So thank you um, out there in webinar world. Um, thank you for joining us. Please spread the news because the more people who join us, the better it is all together. Um, I think I would just like to say that, that there's no uh, more captivating experience, no more learning experience than hearing two people who know and love their subject talking to each other as if the rest of us weren't even listening or in the room. I, I think that was just an amazing experience. Polly, the book's amazing. Hearing you talk about it is just a, a wonderful experience too. And Joe, thank you for enriching the evening with your knowledge, with your love of the subject as well. So the two of you together, Give us a magical evening. So, so I'm going to just sign off by saying that. So, thank you both very, very much. Hannah, thank any you. any final thoughts? Thank you, Senator Jeff. And you even remembered about subscribing to our event bright page. So, I think we've done really well. Yes, please do um, follow our event bright page because we not only put these talks up here, we put all of our other online events on there. So, we also have a contemporary poetry event every month if you want to mix it up with the romantics and the 21st century poets. So hope we'll see you at all sorts of events this year. One thing I just, just wanted to say, I don't know, it's just to emphasize, isn't it, that these events are on YouTube. Um, our past mm. two webinars, Disparate Romantics, are all available. And we were delighted the other day when Polly and, and Joe said that they were used as teaching uh, resources in university courses. So that, that's, that I thought that was a wonderful 
Um, a wonderful uh, accolade, really, for our speakers, really, that they, they provide us with such evenings that then go on to be enjoyed again and again. So at that point, did we say good night? I think we did. We say good night. We say good night. Good night, Polly. Good night, Joe. Good night, Hannah. And good night. Bye, everybody. Night, Thank you. Bye. Bye, Annette.